Normally, we uh, associate the uh, economic crisis because of the development of science and technology. I think that's uh, self-evidently true, but it's also somewhat superficial. There's no question about the fact, uh, maybe the first nuclear bomb, the success of the nuclear bomb, we realize how powerful human beings are in uh, destructive power. But I think underlying science and technology is something else that uh, needs to be taken into consideration. That is uh, sometimes characterized the human drive. You know the story of Faust, right? Almost like Faustian drive to uh, not only to know, to understand, at the time, the idea is to quest for truth. But the quest for truth becomes uh, intrinsically valuable. So you, you try to understand nature, but it's not enough to understand it superficially. You want to find the underlying reasons why uh, nature uh, is such. And that Faustian drive necessarily leads to the psychology of uh, domination. So the idea of a human being as an observer is no, no longer, I think, the, uh, the uh, scientific uh, enterprise is often predicated on the disinterestedness of the observer, but that eventually becomes unsustainable because the observer is no longer looking at an object. Observing or to be a true observer will have to do something, you know, like an experimental, to try to shape the object of analysis in various ways. So the psychocultural underlying um, psychocultural forces turn out to be very powerful in our relationship to nature. In other words, gradually, probably in the 19th century or, or even earlier, the relationship between human and nature underwent a rather fundamental change. But uh, in addition to this tough-minded scientific orientation towards nature, there always consists consisted another another observation, you know, another approach, and that is the romantic idea of uh, the psychology of uh, appreciation and try to understand nature uh, as beauty as something we can appreciate and uh, it's kind of liberating experience of understanding a very deep relationship between us and the mountains and rivers, trees and the world around us. And of course, uh, the, uh, walk, the, uh, uh, the tradition of Emerson and Thoreau and many great poets uh, in America and of course in Germany and England we find this very 
uh, important tradition of appreciation. But uh, the scientific enterprise, especially fueled by the power of technology, uh, continue to advance in the world. It's um, totally um, you know, totally unstoppable. It's almost like uh, a re uh, irreversible process of human power. Currently, this major, you're all aware of it, a major debate between uh, evolution, uh, evolutionism, and the creationism. From the evolutionist uh, observation that uh, there's no meaning in life whatsoever. And just uh, Darwin's vision that somehow the advent of the human based upon all these uh, incredibly complex interaction of molecules and uh, some particular forms emerge as this evolutionary process. You cannot simply argue that there's teleology. Now, that process may be related to some kind of force behind it because it is precisely the reason of this kind of interactions and the survival of the fittest. It's a very basic uh, principle in evolution that uh, life forms, <coughs> eventually human, emerged. And from this point of view, we really cannot do much, which is part of this process. And presumably other uh, life forms will emerge and uh, the human development is only um, one of the phases of the evolutionary process. And recently I was involved in a rather ex extended discussion uh, with uh, an eminent uh, evolutionist. And he just uh, didn't want to address the question of meaning. And uh, teleology was totally relegated to the background. And it's not something that you can imagine useful. Of course, uh, most of the textbooks now uh, just simply assume that's the case. And that angered a large group of uh, Americans, especially Christians. And therefore, uh, creationism also emerged as, as an alternative, uh, alternative explanation. And this, uh, the assumption there must be purpose in life human beings can do, uh, can do being because of certain teleology and the, not the irony, the paradox of that assumption is that no human rationality is capable of understanding why. So there must be a reason that we're here, maybe created in, in the image of God. But uh, we have no way because our limited intelligence to understand what happened. And more recently, and some scientists, excellent scientists, begin to develop this notion of intelligent design. In other words, this creationist process, even taking into consideration of the evolutionary process, seems to, it's so intricate, so complicated, it's not, it's difficult to imagine it's just a natural selection. There must be a certain kind of intelligent design behind it. And of course the evolutionists totally reject that. And then this is the major debate. And I don't think uh, it's easily uh, resolvable, this, uh, this conflict.